The following program is available in high definition on channel 700. This program is designed and produced by the community with the support of TV Kojiko. Hello and welcome to Oakville Matters. It's thanks to Kojiko Cable that we have this means for our community to, to talk to each other about the issues that matter to us. And then we repeat these uh, shows on YouTube to make it possible for you to share them. And today what we're looking at is poverty in Halton and specifically one of the tools that the Halton Anti-Poverty Roundtable, and forgive me for changing the name on you, but I think it makes more sense for this purpose, uh, one of the tools that's being promoted here to help fight poverty and with us today is a member, a volunteer member of, uh, of uh, the Halton Poverty Roundtable, Ian Troop and Andrew Galley, who's a research specialist at uh, York University, and Michael Shane, who's a past director of the Halton Poverty Roundtable. Um, Ian, you have a lot of success as a, as a CEO, as a businessman. You, you ran the uh, Pan Am uh, uh, 2015 Games, uh, four years of outstanding work. Uh, I know in Halton that we had uh, a piece of that. And uh, when you're the mayor and something comes off without any complaints or problems, you have to be impressed. So uh, thanks for what you did. We're impressed. And uh, Andrew, uh, your paper on uh, community benefit agreements has sparked a lot of interest here in our community, and I read it with great interest because it, it, to, a, to a certain degree it resembles other efforts in previous generations to, uh, to lift people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a fair comment, wouldn't you agree, Michael, that in Oakville and in Halton, we're a big fan of the teach them to fish rather than give them a fish approach to trying to deal with uh, poverty. And I think that's what underlies, uh, th that's one of the base concepts of the community benefit agreement. So let's start off, Andrew, by describing uh, for the viewers at home uh, your paper and, and, and what you set out to do in it. Okay, so the, uh, I'm, I guess the paper was uh, co-funded by the Atkinson Foundation, which had a, they've developed a strong interest in uh, looking at a variety of what are called uh, community-based wealth building strategies um, which have to do with moving from a, a top-down model of uh, welfare provision and thinking about the deficits in impoverished communities to thinking about the assets, right, and of, um, of sort of listing and exploring all of the strengths that uh, communities that have historically been somewhat excluded from uh, economic prosperity, what they have to offer and build on. Um, and the CBAs are one of these, and the paper was really designed to look at the origin or history of them and then to bring it into the Ontario context. And this was happening at the same time that Metrolinx, uh, the, uh, the transit corporation, was uh, in, in the business of developing uh, a community benefits agreement for the Eglinton Crosstown uh, light rail system. And they were negotiating that with a coalition of uh, groups in Toronto called the Toronto Community Benefits Network. So I think that as that was going on, um, you know, Moet and Atkinson felt that there was a, a space to kind of explain to a broader policy audience what was going on and, and where it came from. And uh, two days ago at the, the, I guess, historic joint meeting of the boards of the TTC and Metrolinx, uh, the president of Metrolinx, uh, in his remarks, went out of his way to um, stress that Metrolinx is fully committed to these uh, community benefit agreements. And, uh, it's, and it was no surprise to me that our community would, would have the interest that Michael and Ian have shown in this, and, and June Cockwell and the others, mm -hmm. uh, because our community has uh, very, very old and deep ties uh, through family links 
uh, to the Atkinson Foundation and, and all of that. So, um, you know, if not here, then where else? Mm. And, uh, and so I was, uh, uh, you know, in tune with it from the start because it, it you know, Oakville's a town that really likes its heritage, and we have a heritage connection back to Atkinson. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I could say something about how this came to be a more recent conversation. The Halton Poverty Roundtable um, decided last summer that it wanted to hold a series of forums on issues uh, to raise the profile of poverty and instruments that might combat that. And we had heard about Colette Murphy, who had been speaking. We'd read Andrew's paper about community benefits agreements, and we thought it would be a terrific topic. Um, and as much as we thought it would be great, it was that much greater. I mean, the response, the conversation in the room, uh, the response from people to what Colette had to say, was terrific and it motivated us to then go out and write um, a grant application to Trillium to see whether we might get what's called a build the case um, uh, monies to bring together community stakeholders to talk about these issues which is what's happening at the moment. Yeah. And and Andrew, uh, really you deserve a, a lot more credit than I think you uh, may have gotten to date. Your paper is a hope maker, in, in my opinion, yeah. and uh, uh, we have the address for people to get that paper and uh, with a little bit of television magic it should appear on the screen now. And if you follow along the bottom there, uh, mowatcenter.ca, community benefits agreements with those little hyphens or whatever you want to call the, the, the dash that's between the words there. You can go straight to his paper. It's a good read. It's an important uh, document. Uh, any plans to, to build on that and uh, turn it into a book? <laughs> well, um, I did write that paper as part of uh, my job at the Moat Center as a policy associate. So it was a, a corporate product uh, as well as a personal uh, personal project of interest. So I've um, I've moved on from there for now. I'm sort of uh, I'm a, a bit of a I'm a bit of a nomad uh, as far as chasing down uh, opportunities to do policy research in the public interest. So I'm not at the Moat Center anymore. I'm I'm now working uh, on youth issues at York University. So. Uh, not a lot of plans in the near future. I no, think right. our opportunity now is to write the application chapter to his, his <laughs> paper by turning this and bringing it alive in Halton. And uh, you know, the thing that intrigues me about this, and I was surprised when we were at the meeting and Colette started talking about community benefits agreements because at 2015 in the Pan Am Games, we did that for our $700 million of capital and our above $400 million of procurement to try to make sure that that money, yes, it gave us the goods and services we needed and they were done in cost effective way but they also had a social benefit so they moved the, you know, the agenda forward and helped people to use this as a step up in their lives and I think that's the opportunity we have here in Halton is to we have the spending, we'll have the capital investments, we have the procurement and the services we need. Let's do it in a smart way that helps those who may be less fortunate or need that opportunity to uh, be able to see this as a way to improve their situation. So you're the, uh, in, in Halton terms at least, you're the closest thing we've got to somebody who's been there, done that. You were out there on, I guess, the bleeding edge. Did you get cut? Uh, no, I, we, we didn't. We just thought it made good sense. One of our agendas was to make sure that the diverse communities of the GTA uh, were participating in the Pan Am Games, and the diversity of the region just makes that to be common sense. Um, we had some work to do because we were the first project that worked with Infrastructure Ontario to actually write conditions into our infrastructure and we had seven or million dollars of built. Now how was Infrastructure Ontario to work with on that? Um, you know, they were quite rational. They were not an easy sell, but by the same token, when we work together to say this is to the betterment of the community and we're a community project, um, they were became very good applicators. And, and you know, it was funny. But we, you know, when we dealt with them on the hospital, yes, they were risk freaks. So it'd be fun to see how they dealt with those questions. Well, you know, the, the risk is their business. They're trying to manage that whole bit. Yeah. But, um, you know, so you've got to do it in a way that makes good sense from an operational standpoint. It won't come back to bite you later. Yeah. Um, what we found 
in the capital projects was CPL and Elliston, they all said, oh, we do this already. We, you know, uh, community benefit type agreements that look, we were looking for small, medium-sized, diverse businesses could have a place to, to, to flourish as suppliers. They said, we do that. Okay, and that seemed to take the temperature down quite a bit with Infrastructure Ontario because the, the consortiums we were dealing with saw that as being something they do with as a matter of course and it wouldn't interfere with getting the most cost effective uh, agreements in place. And so uh, we learned together through this thing. I would also say though that we were surprised. One of the surprises wasn't the fact that Infrastructure Ontario was hard to buy into this. It was much harder to find those small medium sized businesses than we expected and we had to do a lot more work to uh, identify them to train and organize them so they'd be in a position where they could they could take advantage of it and that caught us by surprise but you know you learn your way into this thing is something you want to get done and you learn your way through it and uh, address those kind of issues which are anticipated and some which aren't well the the whole construction industry has been on a tear since about 1989 mm -hmm. and uh, it's famous or infamous, the difficulty they're having finding skilled labor, and there's huge pressure rising up about we need more apprentices, programs, and, and everything. At the uh, at the police board yesterday, we heard that uh, there's a new form of human trafficking where laborers are, are brought in from other countries, construction laborers, and then uh, their their travel papers are taken away from them, and they're, they're literally... Um, taken to the job site, taken to um, dormitory accommodations, locked in, and then got out in the morning and, and taken back again. It blew my mind to hear that, that our shortages were that bad. And of course, uh, that can't happen without the, the uh, employers uh, uh, you know, assisting it. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly well, there's, there's room for CBAs, I would say. One of the distinctions uh, that's important is Canada at this point, and Toronto in particular, but uh, it's being developed in Quebec and Manitoba and elsewhere, is that the focus in this country for the most part has been around construction projects. So there are hundreds of millions of dollars in Ontario and in future infrastructure projects over the next number of the years. And the idea of building opportunities around that for training and apprenticeship and so on is exciting. If you look at what's going on in Australia, United Kingdom, the US, social procurement is being used for many other kinds of procurement other than construction. And so uh, in a world where there's so much concern that 99% of the population isn't materially represented in the wealth generation and certainly the wealth accumulation, the potential that's being seen in other jurisdictions is transformative. I mean, the idea is not, uh, I mean, not, not that what we're doing here isn't, but I think at a grander scale, when you look at some of what uh, came in under the Blair government that was has been continued under the Cameron government in England, and what a number of U.S. cities are doing to really make this a part of all government procurement, um, it creates a uh, uh, it creates a wide opportunity, and I think construction is a great place to begin. It's a sort of an obvious starting point, but it sure isn't the end of all I what's possible. I can't agree with you more, and you know, it, it's an and opportunity when I mean, you look at this. You know, you can have cost-effective services, and you can do it in a way that benefits your community. And I think we've got to embrace the fact that this can, and the services, the benefit of services are that they have sustainability. So you're not just having a project that starts and stops. You are having to buy cleaning staff or whatever the services you need to procure you know being able to do this in a way that allows you to have apprenticeship programs and develop those uh, under uh, underserved people is a great thing and it won't affect the quality of the service or the cost it should Andrew in your in your papers or whatever you do for youth policy you, you should steal that phrase an and opportunity mm -hmm. I love the I love I'm, I'm stealing that myself uh, By all means. You know, if we listen, if we believe the federal and the and the Ontario governments about infrastructure spending alone, uh, we're looking at ten years of uh, thirty billion dollars a year. However, that gets smoothed out. But you know, the the hundred and sixty from the one and the hundred and thirty from the other, and you know, you're getting real close to three hundred million a billion. I'm so not so. I'm just so unusual to say billion. I can't even say the word. Uh, at the mayor level, we don't deal with billions. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
what, Michael, did you and the rest of the uh, uh, roundtable make of uh, the shape and dimensions of poverty in Halton? Uh, bigger than elsewhere, smaller than elsewhere, the same as everywhere? Uh, do we, I mean, I have said for years that when I read the demographics, we have a smaller problem and a, and a stronger base to deal with it, and so we, above anyone else, ought to be challenged to deal with it, and we ought to show better success than others, because smaller problem, more resources. Where, where is the round table on this question of scale? Well, I think uh, the numbers are surprising in that um, if you live in a place like Oakville, um, you don't necessarily see it uh, in a live enough way, but it's part of the, it's part of the pockets of every community inside of Halton, and the challenge is both people who are unable to participate in the workforce and unable to necessarily get food, but the growing challenge is people who have, have precarious work, so well, they're in employment but they're not able to to meet their family needs. As mayor, I see low income areas in Oakville, and I often find myself having to dispel misconceptions that Oakville's all mansions. We are a fully featured community. We have every every range and piece of society reflected here. Uh, our differences are of degree from from the national and the and the provincial average. It's not a uh, gated community of billionaires in, in any way, shape, or form. Although it was very funny at the Metrolink TTC thing, they put a map up of low income, when they talked about community benefits, yeah. they put a map up where they had, they had of the GTA uh, Hamilton area, it was an outline map, and they had blue uh, blotches for where they, they said were the low income neighborhood areas. And uh, there were these, and I was, I was uh, pleased at the accuracy to see that they had they had little spots in Oakville that correspond with the areas that I know to be low-income areas. And then you know the, where the, the Ford plant is, where the, the highways diverge, there's a gigantic triangular area. Mm -hmm. That was solid blue. Yeah. And I thought, gee, it's the part of town where nobody lives, <laughs> not a single neighborhood in that area, and some of the highest paying jobs in, in, yeah. in the country, never mind in, in town. So, uh, what are the challenges? A that, little bit of an error there. What are the challenges in this community? Um, uh, if we talk just about Oakville, is for reasons that you particularly could imagine, the stigma is that much greater to try and come out of your house and seek services and seek supports, and so that's why the community benefit initiative seems intriguing to me because it's a way to to draw people into the equation. Which into it, the conversation. And that's a very different, I mean, that, that marks quite an evolution of the concept, I think, because, mm -hmm. and, and this is something that I've been wondering about the conversation so far, is where the community is in the Community Benefits Agreement, where the voice is. Because historically, these are, um, these are politically uh, contentious, these are almost like protest movements that CBA start as, yes. where large uh, construction projects are proceeding with public subsidies or public dollars, um, and this is in the states, so th these are often um, downtown revitalization projects in areas that have been excluded from economic development for a very long time, and it's the people in these communities themselves that are forming coalitions and in a sense demanding that they have a, a, a seat at the table that if their tax dollars are going to subsidize uh, a football stadium or you know a shopping mall or whatever that that is that is going to actually bring benefits into their community and when and, uh, and so I, I'm, I guess I'm wondering you know it seems like this spread out, this may totally be a biased statement as a city boy here, so please educate me, but it seems like the spread, very spread out nature of the, um, the other GTA cities like Oakville um, and the hidden, sometimes hidden nature of the poverty here, you know, that, m that must make it a real challenge for people to get together and to talk to each other well, about what their needs well, are and Ian present that platform. Ian, you ran into this because you, earlier you said that you, know, you had trouble finding organizations to do the community benefits with. Well, that was true, and one of the things in Halton Poverty Roundtable, we call it Halton because all of Halton, and, sure. and poverty, the issue is Halton-wide, and our first phase is to 
seek out the community, didn't talk with them, and educate them much like Colette uh, Murphy and Atkinson did around what are we meaning, to see if we can get a coalition of support, and then start seeking out people who can be partners, and that can be construction jobs, it can be how we spend our service monies, but the first step right is happening right now, and on May 25th, we're having a community meeting, we're inviting everybody to come and be informed of what we mean when we say community benefit or social procurement and then say is this something which is meaningful and something that I want to get involved in and it's not just Oakville it's not just Burlington it goes right up to Acton and uh, Georgetown and I think that's the kind of scale and the approach that can breed engaged ownership over making progress on this issue. But to, to, to chase uh, Andrew's point for a second the, um, the missing piece here appears to be the grassroots um, generation of community-based anti-poverty organizations saying, you know, organized around a theme of we want our share, we want, a, we want to be included at the table. And that's the piece that, um, frankly, I, I uh, think might be different in Canada versus the States because in the United States the culture is one of grassroots democracy and everybody believes that power flows up from the people mm -hmm. and we are a crown system of government where no matter what we believe from watching American TV power flows down from the crown and in a crown system mm -hmm. of government mm -hmm. and you know anytime you doubt that just go uh, study on the concept of orders and council and <coughs> ministers uh, orders and and things like that and you'll discover oh yeah there's raw naked power uh, mm. residing in the crown you know what I think is yeah. one of the interesting trends uh, and I like the way you just described that is that when I look at the people who've come together around this in this community they are people who have stopped believing that the political system is the only way, the traditional political system, to actually affect public policy. Mm -hmm. So as they come together around whether you call them interest groups or nonprofit organizations and they begin to coalesce around ideas that make some sense, there is a a sense of empowerment as groups come, to come together around issues like the ones Andrew's talking about to say mm -hmm. it's our responsibility. Yeah. Uh, not that it shouldn't come uh, from the bottom up from those who are most directly affected. But I think what I find in this community is that part of the equation is the intellectual leadership that's coming from people who think this isn't right. And Halton Poverty Roundtable, one of the reasons I was attracted is they view themselves as a catalyzer. So what we're trying to do is bring those interest groups from the community together to, against what we think is articulated an opportunity and then mobilize them to move forward. So it, it so has would to you, be grassroots. Would you go so far as to try to help communities develop their own grassroots organizations to deal with you? Or are you just putting it out there hoping that someone will we're get in, together on it? We're Andrew? in fact organizing on we're our first community meetings on May 25th where we're asking the community to come together to be educated. Then if they want to get involved in the next step, which is action, you know, to form a, an organization which can actually reach out to those people we can partner with. So, so Andrew, what's your sense of um, the difference between, I mean, it, you, I think you make the most trenchant point of all about the difference between the two cultures and the way these groups grew up in the States, because, you know, in the States they were viewed as they, as they came to exist as they were threatening. They were right. Yeah, and and there was I the specter of revolution. It, it was a. It, I mean, you could you could make the comparison to almost like a trade union movement, of you know the of of presenting a sort of a risk to business as usual, saying we're going to disrupt your business as usual unless you deal with us. And I think you're. I, I really liked your comparison of the U.S. and Canada. I would add a little more nuance to it. I think that um, that grassroots democracy uh, is stronger in the states. Uh, and the trade-off for that has often been that the the systems of top-down power, which are there, um, have often been even more excluding to, especially to certain groups of people, racialized people and stuff like this, where there's been a complete shutout. And, and even a sense that it's not just that people aren't listening, but that there's actually an agenda to sort of sweep us aside with these developments. And that is, that's different in Canada. 
and I think, you know, I don't want to romanticize that kind of uprising because, um, you know, as much as it's accomplished things, it takes a whole lot out of people, right? That kind of years-long fight to get a city to listen to you, that's not fun, right? It's, 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 not a, it's not a romantic thing. So we have the potential, I think, in Canada to do things in uh, maybe a less conflictual way, but at the same time, you know, when we institutionalize it, we may be losing some of the the spontaneity or the authenticity of of the the community having that solidarity. When we even start to talk about like, can we educate the community somehow to start organizing itself? That's very confusing to me, right? Like, I don't know. If well, it's, it's an so awkward concept, and and I don't know that it can ever be uh, valid because there is a theory of political organization that says you have to. The group has to come together for its own, uh, mm -hmm. on its own motivation. But I agree with you. There is a major difference between us and the states. Uh, we, uh, I think, Canada come. We in Canada come down very strongly on the side of teaching to fish rather than handing out fish. Whereas what I see going on in the states when I look south is. Uh, a, gig a gigantic polarization where uh, I don't know whether it's most of people or just a, uh, too many of people, but it's a huge number of people whose attitude is I don't care whether they learn to fish or get fish, I don't want anything to do with them. We're going to scare the fish in the boat. Yeah. But you know, we have to take a big tent approach and, and we've got to, and then we've got to have action. And action means I, I think it's a partnership. You, you, by building more fear in, you don't help yourself. And so if we can have a a really clear mandate with the right people on the that have the, at stake they see benefit to it to move forward I think you know we can have a, a big tent with lots of people trying to push on this and have partners that we work with as opposed to opponents we have to defeat and to my mind you know we may not get everybody all at the one time uh, but there's progress being made and we can use the examples of whether it be Metrolinx or it be the 2015 games or what's happening in Scotland or the work you've done in terms of documenting these things um, you know I, it has benefit uh, on multiple levels and we just have to I think be rigorous and resolute to move forward on it. Well Pretty Andrew's cool. caution is is uh, will it uh, will it work uh, is it um, I guess the word genuine comes to mind, but is it authentic's the word I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. Is the community piece of the thing authentic? And uh, I think uh, most Canadians will come down on the side of uh, that that's less important than trying to deal with the problem that animates us, which is to try to deal with poverty. Mm -hmm. And we see these, I at any rate, see these agreements as a tool that might help, but not the only tool we need. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a that's a great point because when you, when you look back at, uh, I mean, this may go well beyond the, the state of modern government, but after the First World War in the UK, the government the government of the day was encouraged to use public procurement of all kinds as a way to bring others into the tent. It's the concept that Andrew and Ian are both talking about, and I think we need to, f community benefits agreements are a good start, they're not the only instrument. And with that, you have the last word, and it's very well said. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll keep the conversation going. You can find this program after you see it on Kojiko, you can find it on YouTube, and share it with your friends. Look forward to seeing you next time.